I've been really active in Pemberton since about 2005. Um, we started up Stewardship Pemberton in 2006, and we gave wetlands is one thing that we do really concentrate on. And um, generally, stewardship as a whole, I'm a little bit salmon centric, so uh, wetlands are an important part of salmon. So um, it, salmon for me is a really good link into all these other regions. But today, I'm going to talk about wetlands and how, um, just so you know, this is what I'm going to talk about. So you know, once I get to current projects in the end, that you're almost free to go. Parts <laughs> of inventory work on the wetlands in Pemberton. So all my pictures are from Pemberton. All the different kinds of critters that I've um, found there. And then I thought I would talk about sort of historically what this valley might have looked like, what the engineers in the past have done, which are really amazing works, and it is pretty much nothing that would get past today, likely. Um, and then management, talking about the wildlife management areas, and then our current projects that we have on the go. So, um, wetlands, what the heck's a wetland? It's um, just like it sounds, um, wetlands are defined basically by the soils and the plants that grow there, and that the soils and plants that are there are there because it's wet. And it may be wet to a certain degree, maybe above or below the water table, but generally a wetland is exactly what it says. And there are five different classifications of wetlands in Canada. It's different from around the world. We, every uh, country has its own way to define wetlands. In Canada we um, talk about five different ones. Shallow open water, so less than two meters of water. Um, an example of that in our area would be One Mile Lake. Often shallow water, um, open water wetlands are paired with other kinds of wetlands like marshes. And the differences in, in these different types of wetlands are generally based on the plants that grow there and the amount of water that comes through. So a shallow open water wetland, you would expect some flow through, both from groundwater and from overland flow, um, but very slowly. And that's what differentiates, say, a wetland from a stream. When you get into marshes, they have very slow moving or standing water. Um, they're periodically flooded. Often the types of things you'll see in a marsh is that sort of classic um, cattail wetland, those plants need to be periodically inundated with water, but they don't like to have their feet wet all year long. They actually need a small period of dry time. And then moving into the swamps are similar to marshes, but they're in forested areas. <coughs> and then fens and bogs are um, something you might associate. We do have fens and bogs here, um, but something you associate with um, the tundra, so really thick sphagnum peat moss where the water table is right at or below the, the surface level, that would be a bog, those really thick, spongy lands. So, um, BC is quite important um, for wetlands. We have wetland complexes to some degree, but our wetlands have been very um, cut up, so there's not a lot of connectivity especially in the landscapes, and we'll see that in Pemberton when we look at some of the larger pictures. Um, only 3% of the province is considered wetland, so it's really, it's, um, it's a small portion of what all the habitat types we have in the province. And that's it, that sort of overview of wetlands. And so, um, why should we care if a wetland is here? Um, wetlands really do provide us some really amazing things that no matter what type of engineering we do, we, it's very hard to replicate what a wetland can provide for us for free. So 90% um, of matter is removed as it flows through, as it flows through a wetland. As it comes through, a lot of the sediments and pollutants are dropped out as the water slows. And much of that, those um, toxins, pollutants, even sediments, are taken up by the plants. And there's these really interesting chemical um, reactions that happen that much of those chemicals are actually released when the plant dies as a non-toxic material. 
So that's why you see places like near Stanley Park where they have these biofiltration wetlands to deal with storm waters in, um, in the cities because they're very effective as being a natural pollutant filtration system. Something for Pemberton. Wetlands are incredibly important for flood control. Engineers love to move water straight and quick and get it off the land as soon as possible. And that's sort of been the train of thought for a very long time. Wetlands sort of provide the opposite. They provide this buffer, they act like a sponge. So when the water comes in really quickly, they suck it up and they hold on to it. So they do flood, but they will hold on to that water and release it back slowly. So through the plants and the structure of the actual wet area, they provide a lot of protection from erosion. And then they also provide not only soaking up flood waters, but then releasing that water slowly during dry times. So um, um, that you'll see in the pictures that I'll show a little bit later on in Pemberton how much of that wet area we've lost. And I'm sure that we have seen flooding um, to certain degrees over the last thousand years, but in trying to move the water very quickly over hard surface may not be the best way to do it in the long term. Nature does things a certain way and sometimes it's best to try and mimic what they do well. Um, wetlands are essentially also a transitional area. So you're transitioning between very wet and very dry, the upland versus the water. And those areas that are transitional are incredibly rich areas for all sorts of species because you have the overlap of both um, the upland and the water. So they are incredibly important breeding areas and habitat for all sorts of different um, critters that live there. And I'm going to go through that a little bit more. Um, habitat, you don't see a lot of the species without those habitats can't exist. So if you do fill in, even in an ephemeral wetland, a wetland that only lasts for a short time through the year, you won't, you can't replicate that. At, for instance, some um, certain salamanders or frogs can't just go to the river and lay their eggs because the habitats are different and you will lose those populations entirely. Um, in this world um, that global warming, wetlands are incredibly important as carbon sinks. And finally, um, aesthetic values. For me, um, I just love being in the wetland. Uh, I love swimming in a wetland. A lot of people think that's really gross, but I really recommend it at the time <laughs> because it's a beautiful place. It's a bit mucky getting in there, but once you're in there, it's just, it, it's a wonderful place to be. And so these recreational values, scientific values, and educational opportunities that come with wetlands are really important for preserving them. Okay, some of the cool things that I found in Pemberton. This is a northwestern salamander. This particular salamander, they often in juvenile stage, they get those feathery gills. This one lives underwater. Because we do have this cold winters, it's quite common for this salamander to reach maturity in water and begin, they'll actually live their whole life in water. If we are a bit further south, this particular salamander would lose its gills and it would become a terrestrial salamander. In our area, you'll quite often find these guys living in their water their entire life. The actual reach sexual maturity of water, they're a water creature. And this guy was trapped in the agricultural ditch that starts at Riverlands and goes about 11 kilometers up the valley, and he was sort of halfway up there. But I have trapped them sort of throughout that whole ditch. Um, they are a carnivorous species. They eat pretty much everything that moves. Um, and like all the other salamander that we have here, they're quite poisonous to predators. So they're very effective in warning off predators because they secrete a poison out of their tail. So, and the other interesting thing about these guys is they actually store quite a bit of fat in their tail. So they don't give it up too easily, but worst case scenario, like many of our salamanders and, and reptiles, they can lose that tail and it will grow back. Okay, this... How long, how long is that settlement? How, they get up to 25 centimeters. Okay. So they'll get up to quite large. That guy there... Um, yeah, sorry, can the settlement hit poison hurt a human? No, no. It can irritate some people, but they're not toxic to humans. And it's not likely we would eat one. It might be different if we ate a whole bunch. I'm not sure. 
So these guys were, came out of um, the ditch at the Helmers. Uh, these are long-toed salamanders with a predaceous diving beetle. And then those little brown specks is cat food that I used to trap to bait them in the trap with. Oh, you should. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, so this is just one single trap set for about six hours. And uh, there's a whole mass of them. These guys, similar to the long toes, um, <laughs> sorry, for, to the Northwesterns, very, very cold climates, more like the Alpine, they will stay their whole lives in water, but most of these guys will become terrestrial. And you can see a lot of these guys don't have their gills. They're probably just out there for a great old time in the breeding. Um, across the road, by your old little, the little hut there, where the ditch goes to there. Yeah. yeah, and it would be difficult to see, really, um, you know where the road goes through and your tents are off on the left there? They, um, just at the culvert there under the road. And they're really specific to trap, like trapping is really weird. This is why you throw a whole lot of traps in, because there was the one trap upstream of the culvert, well I had about four, and then I had four traps downstream, and only one trap had these many, this, these salamanders, and then all the others were empty. So you could throw a whole bunch of traps in, catch nothing, but you might have just missed that one little habitat type. That's why the government has all these regulations on how we trap things, and, before you can say that so nothing. Exactly just look at them and let them know, but yeah, so this this particular project was part of an inventory project to see if that ditch was fish bearing. Because obviously for agricultural maintenance, working with the Dyken District, their um, ditch maintenance is quite different if it's got fish or not. So we were working on a plan to look at different water qualities and also habitat, see see what lives there. It's not likely you would see, I mean, you could see salmon here. Um, this particular area, I haven't caught any salmon in that ditch um, ever, and the water quality isn't the best for salmon. These guys don't need the same, same kind of water quality. Salmon are really specific, really cold water. These guys can live in a range of temperatures. Um, okay, now these guys are cool. They, not only do they just secrete a poison that tastes bad, it's actually really sticky and, and it's like rubber cement. So if they have a small predator like a vole that's trying to get them, they secrete this poison and it could actually stick a vole to the spot for up to 40 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and so they have time to get away. Yeah, it's really cool. So, um, and like the Northwesterns, they can regenerate body parts. And um, probably everybody knows this guy and if you don't know him to see him, you've heard him in Pemberton. This is the tree frog. This, um, he's, uh, yeah, he's a funny color. I have so many pictures of tree frogs and they are a whole spectrum of rainbows of colors. Um, they are a really, uh, they're really great at general habitats. They sort of live everywhere. They're doing very well. I saw a news story on BCTV about two weeks ago about a neighbor that's been fighting with this woman who's got this okay. tiny little pond and his neighbor can't her neighbor can't stand the sound of the frogs and he's ready to blow her pond up. So in here she had this tree frog. And they do make quite a bit of noise in the spring. Um, I don't understand how anyone can dislike that noise. They're very small. They can, when they actually are metamorphosed, they can be up to four, two to four centimeters. So they're coming out of the ponds very, very small, but they do grow, um, I mean, they'll sit in the palm of your hands as an adult. So, but when they do come out of the ponds, they're, you know, two centimeters. So they're very small. Um, they won't call, I've, I really love the sound, there's a small wetland on the fraser Ertle connector there, the little trail there, and the wetland there, the, the just, I live in the Glen and I hear them all the time and I wanted to go sit at night and just listen to them, but they, they stop calling as soon as you go near because they feel threatened, and if they feel very threatened, they can throw their voice, voice quite well, so something neat about these guys, and um, they are very good at changing color. I'm sure if I took this guy's picture, you know, the next day, if it was hot and sunny, he'd be nice and bright and green. So this um, is a northern alligator lizard. Um, if you've lived in Pemberton, you may or may not have seen this. I've seen a number of them. I don't know if I'm just lucky, but um, I love this guy. I had one in my garage when I first moved here. Um, he's not specifically a wetland reptile. He does obviously need that wet part of his life to live, um, just in terms of drinking water. He's more of an upland species, but I did trap or I did take this picture um, at the Fulton's wetland by the railway 
overpass a little out there. And I just threw them in here because I thought it was important to show the transitional importance of wetlands versus upland. Because here he was just setting himself on a rocky outcrop just above that wetland. And uh, he hibernates in the winter, like all the other reptiles. And um, the females are really cool. They give birth to live young. So uh, and she'll have um, four or five live little alligators crawling around in the, around this time, which is pretty cool. And yeah, I just think these are one of the coolest hibernating guys. Okay, so here's this beaver. I took this picture flying up to the upper Lillooet. Um, this, er, ignore that cohort word there. <laughs> this uh, is a beaver pond at the bottom of this avalanche chute. And I've flown up there um, a few times in the last few, um, last year, so I've been working up there. But I love how this guy, this sort of shows how industrious beavers are. He's obviously been wiped out by this avalanche because the toe of the avalanche was quite a bit um, farther down earlier on, and yet he keeps going, and you can't stop him. But they're an important part of wetlands, and creating wetlands, and um, beavers are a nemesis of mine, but I also love them dearly, and it's just finding the balance. Because once we build our roads and our trails and our railways, and our rivers aren't able to go where we want them to go, it's really hard to find that balance between beavers and and us, so. Is that, is that really two beaver dams we're looking at? Then? There's two beaver dams, and actually there's a series of five, mm -hmm. and they go right up. The snow is melted, obviously now, and he's got dams all the way up there. But I mean, a month before this, the whole thing was covered, so I don't know where his lodge is. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if he's smart or not. So each one doesn't represent a different family of beavers, though. No, but beavers are very um, communal. The, a lot of a uh, couple families might live together, but they are very territorial. So if you do try and relocate a beaver, that generally doesn't end well. Um, but the, I think the largest number of beavers living in one lodge was 32, and there was a muskrat in there too. Oh my so there's <laughs> they they do. Um, like to have a lot and they coexist okay with muskrats. They do, yeah, yeah. yeah. They have they share habitats and really great pictures of coho that are alive. Um, a lot of them are dead spawned out fish. So I just thought I'd throw our little um, this is a sign that was done with some funding that's at one mile lake new the new, around the new trails and it just talks about the coho uh, journey. Cohos are some of my favorite salmon because they are so weird. They love these really little um, small agricultural ditches. They love these seemingly valueless habitats, um, slow moving water, even areas that are ephemeral, so areas that don't have much flow through the summer. And they live a year in fresh water, so they need that wetland habitat to really, as part of their life cycle. So, and um, we have coho all over this valley. And again, uh, I am salmon centric, and I promise I'm not going to talk too much about coho, but if you have questions about them. The year they live, is that the first year that they live in the fresh water? Yeah, so they, they um, spawn around October, November. And they, um, even some, we get a late run into January, and then those eggs will hatch by March, and they will live in that wetland until the next so March or April. So they're there for a full year and then they're out to the ocean for three or four years before they return. So influences. Okay, so obviously we are a huge influence on wetland habitat. This is the BC Rail um, crossing by um, Bob Benzels there as part of the Iron Canal, formerly Two Mile Creek. Um, these are beaver deceiver culverts that are failing horribly at this point. They were installed incorrectly, and after two more incorrect CN rail installations, still are not functioning. Um, so we can just, I just threw this picture in there because we're a huge influence with our infrastructure, these highways and railways and all sorts of things. We have all these great influences on um, wetland habitats. Um, this is that valley ditch. It's really cool. This section comes from the Riverlands old 
um, connection between the Ryan and the Lillooet, where the Lillooet used to meet the Ryan, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about this just after this. But this is channelizing and um, redirecting water, and this is actually still quite important habitat, but as, as far as um, a wetland that you would expect to see, it's a little bit different. Um, pollution, this is um, downstream of the highway bridge coming into the Arn Canal. Um, that's a culvert there. Um, this is all, I'm not sure what, coming off the highway's yard. It's uh, sand and silt trucks and uh, possibly paint. But um, just pollution obviously is a big, uh, especially with agricultural land. Um, you do get an influx of um, different fertilizers and all those sorts of things, and because the wetland is generally still moving water, it flows in there and it can and it will stay there. And here is um, this is the wetland where cows have been, so you can see not a lot of vegetation left around the edges. And this type of wetland, what we normally do here is we use some fencing. And then we make sure we, the cows have all these uh, openings to the water. But the areas where we um, have the openings, we put a hard surface down. So uh, just a fallable surface so that the cows don't sink and muck it up. And then it allows the rest of the, the pond to, res to restore. Because wetland is, wetlands, if nothing else, are really um, resilient. They can come back if we allow them to. So, and really, habitat destruction and alteration, that is the number one cause of sort of species loss, not only in wetlands, but across all habitats. Um, so it's just, that, that is the main one. And below pollution or invasive species or anything like that. And speaking of invasive species, um, wetlands, we do get a bit of problems with invasive species. Purple loosestrife here. Um, there's certainly a lot of terrestrial ones, but we have seen purple loosestrife put a bit in some of the ditches. And it's the, in Ontario that's just taken over um, wetlands. So it's definitely something to watch for. Okay, Hammerton. Um, I am, this is a picture, again, I took from a helicopter. I'm just going to pass these uh, around. And um, I think that's okay. These are just aerial photos. These are from 1957, sort of showing all the different cuts that were done. And still shows the Lillooet in its original form and then the cuts that were made in the early 50s, 1945, showing proposed cuts. And I really love this map because you can see, I've done a lot of work with the Arm Canal. So this particular one shows the proposed cut here of the Arm Canal, where it is today. Um, and so,
and they're dealing with some serious erosion problems. Um, and really that's what happens, and that's where you get your hard engineering, your riprap, and your rock walls to keep trying to fight Mother Nature on this. <clears throat> is that because the river always wants to yeah. snake? Yeah, it is. But I'll just show you the aerial photograph because this is in town. This is an awesome picture from 1947. And this is town laid above it. And here's the railway crossing there. And this is the breach here. This is all little at river, all in the center of the highway and the glen. And I love this picture. And one mile is not really defined here. You can see water sort of comes in everywhere. Looks like Cumberland Creek is through there. So that's um, when you say the breach, is that the wetland that's uh, yeah, this is the Erdl the Erdl Fraser, Fraser connector. connector, right? It's this old yeah. channel that yeah. came out from the from the Lillooet. Yeah. Now, so and you can see how the main Where's channel of the Lillooet still continues this way. It splits here. There's talk of reintroducing water into this particular channel with this hillside development. That's sort of just talk right now. And I'm not sure what that would look like. Can you find out the Iron Canal? What's that? The Iron Canal there on that map? It's not there. It's, it's Two Mile Creek still at this stage. You can see oh, it here. Right. So this, sorry, this is an Iron Canal one. So this is today's right. Iron Canal. Yeah. And this in this picture, it's still Two Mile Creek. There's the oh, pond, right. and it continues like this. Right. And then there's another pond right around the railway trestle. Yeah. And then it just connects in with this wetland complex. <laughs> so this section of the Arn Canal, this is Collins Road. Yeah. Here and then yeah. Harmony Meadows Road. And that's an awesome little piece of old Humal Creek that fills with water every spring. And you can see it's just this Arn Canal is just dying to go back in there. Yeah. So we do actually have plans and do drawings to reintroduce water into that section. Um, you know, there's um, one, two, three, four landowners to talk to, but um, I mean, these discussions are. The good thing about it is that we are having these discussions currently. Uh, I don't, and it is talking about habitats. I mean, can I restore a habitat to what it once was? Likely not. I'm not just going to build that and they will come. Uh, I think it, it can be greatly improved over what we have here, um, but it'll be many years before it's functioning like it may have. And um, I do a lot of restoration work in, in the work that I do, and um, many, many of the projects we do work really, really well, and you can actually see salmon spawning and things that you've placed with your hands, and in other instances they fail miserably. And, Fill with silt and they're gone in a year. So it's um, it's really hard to recreate no matter what engineers you have on your side, what once was. And that's where you get into the importance of protection for the things that we have left because, again, it's very hard to build what you've lost. 